Can I get started? I, I'm Courtney Worrell. I'm the president and CEO of the Waterfront Alliance, and welcome to today's webinar. Thanks for taking time out this morning to hear from us about uh, this report that we've put together and from the many partners who have collaborated with us on it as well. So I'm just going to do a quick introduction and then I'll turn it over to my colleague, Karen Imus. But um, two weeks ago, we launched the report Activating New York City Owned Waterfront Sites for Recreation and Access Action Plans for Four Underutilized Sites in High Need Communities. This report is a really important for spurring what we hope will be advocacy for city investment, New York City investment in waterfront recreation in communities that have seen virtually no waterfront resource improvements in the, la in the last decades and long before that. New York City, as we all know, has benefited for many years from major waterfront revitalization and opened up new recreational opportunities to thousands of New Yorkers. And this is wonderful. These are places like Brooklyn Bridge Park, Governor's Island, the west side of Manhattan. These are places where people can work, play, and thrive on the water, boating, fishing, and environmental programming, so many things. But improvements like this have not taken place in communities that benefit from some of the, that would benefit from some of the greatest, uh, excuse me, I want to start again. These improvements have not taken place in communities that do not have the same access to financial resources and political visibility as the community as I just mentioned. We're excited about this report because of what it can mean for the communities that have been walled off from their waterfront develop their waterfronts for generations, but they're also on the front lines of climate change. So if we don't recommit to a vision for a waterfront revitalization that also includes climate resilience, we will lose an opportunity for enjoying the benefits of the water, but also preparing for the future that's about to come. So we really think this is a pivotal moment to include many of this, many of you in this discussion about how we can move forward with these locations and make them open and accessible for the communities next to them and around them. So this report was conducted um, over about a two year period and uh, Karen I uh, led it along with Ray Fusco, our consultant who is with us today as well. You'll hear about the data analysis we did, the community outreach and all the things that we need to do to move forward. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Karen and, uh, and thank Karen and Ray for their leadership and their work on this project. Great. Well, good morning, everyone. And thank you so much, Courtney, for the introduction. Uh, it's great to see a lot of familiar and a lot of new faces joining us this morning. Um, and I'm very excited about uh, the release of this report and the opportunity to brief you all uh, this morning about our findings and to be joined by uh, four of our community partners who you will be uh, hearing from uh, this morning. So just to set some context and give some background about um, how this all got started. Um, so as you know, today, New York uh, City's waterfront consists of a green and blue network of parks and open spaces that spans all five boroughs and rivals that of uh, most global coastal cities. And as you also probably know, waterfront access is defined by formal and informal settings as disparate as some of signature parks like Brooklyn Bridge Park or Hudson River Park and hundreds of waterfront street ends or vacant lots uh, often owned by the city, um, hidden gems uh, that dot the 520 miles of coastline. Um, informal waterfront access points, some of which you see in this slide, are sometimes fenced off from the public, not always, um, but they are not official parks or green spaces. Uh, but many of these sites are being stewarded and cared for by local community groups, as well as used uh, for recreational purposes by the public. So as Courtney mentioned, Waterfront Alliance undertook a study to identify and develop action plans for New York City owned sites ready to be transformed by the city into vibrant and accessible waterfronts in the communities they would benefit uh, the most. And this report really shines a light on the infrastructure needs and possibilities at four city owned waterfront sites located in communities with historic disinvestment. And a key aspect of the report is to explore increasing opportunities uh, for in-water access, not just waterfront access. Um, the report serves as an advocacy tool to spur uh, uh, city investment in waterfront recreation in communities that have seen virtually no waterfront resource improvements in the last few decades, and where there is a growing appetite to access local waterfronts, create climate resiliency, and enjoy quality open space. 
this work builds on Waterfront Alliance's uh, June 2020 report called Waterfront Access for All. And it also builds on many of the findings in the recently released New York City Comprehensive Waterfront Plan, which I'll talk a little bit more about uh, today as well. So the Comprehensive Waterfront Plan, which came out in uh, December of uh, last year, um, was a really a, a, an amazing comprehensive effort by the city to set a 10 year vision for possibility around the water's edge, everything from climate resiliency to economic development to uh, recreation. And one of the key uh, findings is to expand public access to the waterfront with an emphasis on equity by bridging access gaps in historically underserved areas and supporting growing waterfront communities. And city owned waterfront sites do play an important role in filling this equity gap. Uh, some of the really statistics that stood out to us uh, talk about uh, how many individuals in the city have easy access to their local waterfronts. And one of these points out that more than 90% of Manhattan residents within a half mile of the waterfront can walk to open spaces on the water, but fewer than half of Bronx residents and only about half of Staten Islanders living with that same, within that same distance have pedestrian accessible public access options. And we know that even within Manhattan, which is ringed by public parkland, there are economic disparities that exist between neighborhoods with and without waterfront access. So a really important part of this effort was how we undertook the data analysis to hone in on the four priority sites. And through open source data on public sites, social vulnerability statistics, and climate hazard indicators, as well as a lot of community partner conversations and surveys and site visits, Waterfront Alliance developed a short list of potential sites. And I wanted to turn it over um, to our uh, consultant and colleague, Ray Fusco, who worked very closely on this project to talk a little bit about the various data sets and criteria for uh, site selection that we went through uh, as we worked on this project. Great, thank you, Karen. Um, wonderful project, happy to be involved. Uh, thanks for everyone coming. Um, as we reviewed the different sites around the city, we structured the review um, with two different sets of criteria. So one, we looked at the physical site criteria, and then the second, we looked at the community uh, social vulnerability criteria to evaluate greatest need. So within the physical site criteria, we had six larger and broader topics, safety, of course, currents, tides, hazards, sea state, commercial traffic, potential uses, uh, encouraging highest and best diversity of use. I think it's important to mention here that uh, we've, re we've mentioned recreation several times, but really in community feedback in, in our look at all these sites, taking into consideration environmental education programming, um, simple just get down to the water, recreation, and a variety of uses were uh, reviewed. Uh, the other thing was we took a look at the community interest is there a community group? Is the community engaged around the site? And have they engaged in this waterfront site previously? Density, we took a look at the proximity of the sites that we chose in comparison to other launching locations or other access locations. Um, we also took a look at repair and upgrade, the cost, the time, and the energy it would take to create access to the site. And then long-term management, what kind of uh, options we had to do that. So within this cluster of criteria, we created a numeric value system and a ranking system to create a score for them. It was an objective effort that we worked on together to create a score. On the Community Social Vulnerability Index, those are already established, structured uh, data sets. And so we chose individual data points from those to build a framework to demonstrate community need. So we took a look at the CDC Social Vulnerability Index. It's important to mention here that much of these, this side of the criteria follows uh, census track data. And so as we looked at these different data points, the Opportunity Atlas, we looked at household incomes. Um, city planning has community district profiles with wonderful in, in, information. We looked at the New York City poverty measure, which is slightly different from the national poverty measure, taking into account some um, cost of living differences with New York City uh, rather than the nation. Also access to parks, uh, people per square mile. We also looked at the New York State disadvantaged 
uh, community map and took a look at a couple of criteria in the climate risk, climate change risk and health burdens. We also looked at the race and Hispanic origin data as well as population by age. It is important to mention, I'd say, for this particular side of the criteria that since this was census tract data, you know, the waterfront locations weren't always perfectly and neatly located in the center of the census tract. And so we did take a look at the adjacent community data to make sure we were understanding the community need and really uh, framing up uh, best uh, community opportunities. Karen? Thanks for that, Ray. So after a, a real deep dive into this overlay of different um, data and statistics, um, we were able to hone in on four particular sites. And I think it's really important to mention that one of the criteria was also looking at um, community engagement, existing community engagement and stewardship um, of, of various sites where there was active use, um, active recreation and active community involvement. And with that, we honed in on action plans for four sites, the Borden Avenue Street End in Long Island City, um, Big Rock Beach, uh, which is informally known the 28th Avenue Street End in College Point, the Lincoln Avenue Street End in Port Morris, and the Front Street parking lot along the North Shore of Staten Island. And we'll get into a little bit more on each one of these sites so let's kick it off with the Lincoln Avenue Street End in Port Morris along the South Bronx Peninsula. A community partner working very actively at the site is South Bronx Unite. And you could see the street end here uh, from the vantage point of the Harlem River. A couple of maps here to give you some context, uh, sort of an aerial view from, from Google um, street maps. But also importantly, we use the New York City Planning Waterfront Access Map to really look at what public access points exist in these various geographies. And I think it's really important to point out the South Bronx Peninsula here, which has largely uh, no waterfront public access points uh, along the whole uh, peninsula edge there. So a little bit of, about the site and what, uh, what you sort of technically see there. This is a, a unique street end that's sitting at the intersection of uh, various uses and active industrial property run by waste management, a new private residential development uh, being, being built by Brookfield Properties and the active Oak Point uh, Rail. Um, I think one of the most challenging aspects of a project of this nature are the jurisdictional questions around some of these street ends or uh, lots. In this case, um, the, this marginal street um, merits further investigation as to whether the city or the state has um, authority over this particular site. Uh, what we do know, however, is that this, this industrial site is in dire need of shoreline stabilization. There's a deteriorated bulkhead and a coordinated effort among city, state and local partners would make a, a huge improvement. Um, this is a quiet Harlem River location. Uh, again, South Bronx Unite has been actively engaging the community around programming, and we'll hear more about that. And the community need is also well uh, demonstrated. Uh, there's potential for, for green infrastructure improvements, for direct water access with investments, and for greater community programming. And that has really been reflected in surveys that we did at each one of these sites. So part of this effort included going out into the community and developing digital surveys as well. So we had the opportunity to table at a few South Bronx Unite events and um, had some help uh, distributing a, a digital survey. And, and this is what we heard in the responses that 100% of the respondents would like to see waterfront activation. Almost 40% of the respondents had visited this site with educational groups. 37% um, of the respondents would like boating opportunities and some of the most common needs um, include things like trash cans, dog bag stations, benches, shade and plantings, a small floating dock and wayfinding. And you'll see that these kinds of responses are sort of a common thread uh, across the various sites where the public is um, you know, looking for some, um, I don't wanna say minor necessarily, but some basic improvements that would make these sites more really uh, user-friendly. Um, and wayfinding is a, a really important part of that aspect as well, getting the public familiarized with where, where these sites are located. Um, and I also wanted to point out some of the testimonials that I think are really also telling about how the public is really starting to think about the waterfront in, in more holistic uh, and kind of 
uh, more visionary ways. Um, one of the respondents to this survey posted a comment about bringing the schooner Apollonia, which is coming down uh, uh, the Hudson with all sorts of um, uh, Hudson Valley sort of farm to table products into New York City um, and, and using this location to potentially uh, dock other small human scale sustainable sail freight uh, vessels. So really great to hear some of this kind of visionary view of what might be possible. And uh, I wanna turn it over now to um, our community partner at um, South Bronx Unite, Arif Ula, to talk more about the extensive work that he and, and the organization and the community have been doing around the Mott Haven Port Morris uh, waterfront plan uh, to really support activation along the peninsula. Thanks, Karen, uh, and thanks also, Ray. It's been a real pleasure working with both of you on this uh, project. So. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, glad to be part of this conversation. Uh, before I review our waterfront plan, uh, I just want to give a description of South Bronx Unite. Uh, in short, we work with neighborhood residents, community organizations, and academic institutions to advocate for equity and justice uh, for the specifically the Mott Haven and Port Morris sections of the South Bronx. The South Bronx is comprised of several uh, neighborhoods. Environmental justice uh, and as related health equity are two of the main threads that run through all of our work. Uh, next slide, please. Our waterfront plan was developed almost 10 years ago uh, through a series of community visioning sessions at which neighborhood residents shared their ideas for an open green space on the waterfront. Uh, so the Lincoln Avenue street end, which Karen reviewed, is a part of the waterfront plan. Um, but I'm going to give you an overview of our entire plan and talk a little bit about the Lincoln Avenue street end at the end. Uh, so the waterfront plan was prioritized by the New York State uh, Department of Environmental Conservation Open Space Committee in 2014. Uh, sadly, that didn't translate to any resources or action from policymakers uh, and state agencies to make the plan a reality. However, because of our sustained advocacy, uh, there is some momentum now. Next slide, please. So here are some pictures uh, of community visioning sessions that uh, we led. Uh, and you can see some are indoors, some are outdoors. One is at a, a park that's just nearby um, at Maria Sola. And uh, Karen came out to that for our waterfront day. And then um, from there, we did some tours of the waterfront. And on the upper left corner, you'll see one of the tours of the waterfront and in fact of the Lincoln Avenue street end that we did uh, a few years ago. And we conduct regular tours of the waterfront um, as part of our advocacy. Uh, the way we think about it, the more people who know about the waterfront, um, the, the better it is for us. And we can uh, lift that up as um, a, an important issue for our community. Next slide, please. So you can see on this map that Mont Haven and Port Morris lie in a peninsula, and as, as Karen mentioned earlier. But what's tragic and upsetting is that there's virtually no access to the waterfront. Uh, in fact, some neighborhood residents don't even know that the water is so close. Uh, the Lincoln Avenue street end is one of the only access points. Um, and even then, it's dangerous to reach. Uh, and you know, Karen and, and Ray can speak to that as well. Uh, when they visited, uh, we were contending with a constant stream of garbage trucks. Um, on the road, because that's the only road that leads to the waterfront. There's a major uh, waste management facility just down the block from it. So on that note, it's important to share that the South Bronx has the dubious distinction of being New York City's epicenter for environmental injustice. Generations of people of color have been overburdened with environmental pollution, including a disproportionate number of waste transfer stations, peak power plants, we have four of them, expressways, we've had the major Deegan, the Bruckner, uh, we've got the Cross Bronx, we've got five Manhattan Bronx thoroughfares. We also have heavy manufacturing and diesel truck intensive shipping operations. So this has created a toxic soup um, in our air. And that's the air we're the, that we're breathing. Um, at the same time, the area has among the lowest access to green space per capita in the entire city. There's only one real green space for 60,000 people. So this reality, along with the cumulative impacts of pollution and poverty, has resulted in alarmingly high asthma rates in children in the Bronx. Um, twice as likely to be hospitalized for asthma and more likely to die of asthma than children in other parts of the country, which is tragic. Uh, other air pollution related illnesses include infant mortality, cognitive impairment, diabetes, heart disease, and dementia. Um, and with the onset of the effects of climate change, 
from extreme storm related flooding to the urban heat island that quality of life for community residents is worsening. So for our community, an open green space on the waterfront isn't just a matter of beautification and recreation, it's a matter of health, equity and justice. So turning back to the map, what you see here indicated by the letters are the different sections of our waterfront plan. Um, and as much as we would love to have it built all together, it can be developed in phases. The asterisk that you see just to the left of C is the location of the Lincoln Avenue street end. Uh, next slide, please. This map here shows our waterfront is in a level two flood zone. And not surprisingly, the area experienced um, heavy flooding and damage during Superstorm super Sandy, as well as last summer as a result of Hurricane Ida. Um, so our waterfront plan would also create a, uh, a first line of defense against flooding like this. Next slide, please. Uh, and the next three slides are just sections of our waterfront plan, and we'll go over those very quickly. Um, you can see here a picture of the Bronx Kill, uh, which is a narrow stretch of water that connects the Harlem River with the East River. Um, next slide, please. This is what we call the Park Avenue Boat Launch, and we'd love to see more water-based recreation on our waterfront. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the Lincoln Avenue Street End. Uh, Karen showed you pictures of it already. Um, this was taken when it was beautified by community members a few years ago. Uh, but you know, without resources and very limited access to the site, uh, it quickly became an eyesore again. Um, and uh, we can see what it looks like in the winter these days. And, uh, and next slide, please. I'm sorry, Karen. Um, and this is how it, it often looks like um, these days. And the um, last slide, please. So here are some sketches of the site. Um, the one on the left was developed by uh, University of Pennsylvania design students, and the one on the right was sketched by a local architect. Uh, so to wrap it up, we think the site has tremendous potential, and we're grateful to be working with the Waterfront Alliance to activate it. We, our community is in dire need of spaces like this, so they can literally breathe a little easier. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arif, for, for the comments and for these great visuals um, and for all the amazing work that, that you're doing in the South Bronx community. It's um, such, yeah, I think, an, an inspirational to see the community engagement and, and the vision around uh, activating the peninsula. And I think really important to underscore that, um, you know, plans exist, right? This, this Mott Haven Port Morris waterfront plan has had a lot of input from uh, not only the community, but from, from engineers and designers and planners who have put their heads together to create these renderings. And that when uh, we're having conversations with the city about activation, um, that there are great ideas and great visions and great renderings that uh, exist in the world um, that we can be looking to uh, for, for inspiration to really move these sites forward. So we will move on to site number two. And that is uh, in Queens, uh, a, a, a very different uh, street end, uh, but with a, a lot of the similar dynamics. Uh, this is the 28th Avenue street end in College Point, uh, also called Big Rock Beach. The community partner actively working there is Coastal Preservation Network. Uh, again, we'll run you th through some maps here. You see some of the aerial views um, from Google Street Map. And the waterfront access map again shows the lack of public access along the College Point shoreline. Uh, you have some public parks at the very northern end, uh, but the whole sort of shore here of the College Point Peninsula it has uh, virtually no public access points. Uh, so Big Rock Beach is a, a very unique site in that it's a large uh, sandy beach. Uh, you have to uh, go down to the water on a sort of a steep vertical edge and so um, improvements and actually getting down to the beach are, are really an important part of the kind of infrastructure vision for this site. Um, great programming potential because of the quiet waters along um, Flushing Bay. Um, we know that this is a DCAS owned site. Um, uh, it does have a lot of debris, both in the water and sort of along the shoreline that Coastal Preservation Network has been working very actively to, to clean on a regular basis with volunteers. Um, you know, basic uh, maintenance like receptacles, uh, benches would be bring a lot of added value here, uh, as well as an operations and maintenance program, which we'll, we'll talk more about how operations and maintenance is an important part uh, for each of these sites. Um, there is a CSO, um, not directly proximal, but um, in the vicinity. Um, and we also know that there are some active citizen water quality testing programs taking place 
uh, along different sites uh, throughout College Point and, and other uh, sites in this project um, where the community is very engaged in helping to uh, sort of bring knowledge about um, the state of water quality uh, in some of these areas. We had some very active survey responses in this site. 95% um, uh, would like more waterfront access. We had half of our survey respondents were aware um, of Big Rock Beach, which does speak to the need for wayfinding. Um, a very strong uh, response around volunteerism and, and interest in cleanups. Uh, and again, some of the most common needs point out benches, trash receptacles, small dock and safe uh, stair access. Um, there's a lot of interest in just having a family gathering place in the area uh, and also the opportunity to launch kayaks there, obviously with the with a soft shoreline uh, and a beach, uh, it, it's, it's easy to get the boats in the water, but getting them down the stairs is really the challenge um, at, this, at this juncture. Um, and I'd like to turn it over to uh, Kat Servino from Coastal Preservation Network to talk more about the work uh, that they're doing uh, in the community and at Big Rock Beach. Take it away, Kat. Thank you so much, Karen. And um, I appreciate Waterfront Alliance and all the work that you've done and the ability to be included in this conversation. Um, and Arif, your presentation was really strong and wonderful. So thank you for that. Um, so College Point, you know, it's historically a, a waterfront community with a, a lot of things going on on the water. There was active boating, active beach use. Um, over the years, it's become more industrial in many parts of town. You know, we have um, a marine uh, marine transfer station for solid waste. We have a sprawling sewage treatment plant that grows, you know, larger and larger by the decade, it seems, to accommodate the ever densely populated um, town with zoning changes over the years. Um, it's gone from a lot of single and two family homes to a lot of six, eight, you know, family um, apartment complexes, a lot more dense development. So just to state that, to say that there really is a need for people to escape, for serenity, a place to go, you know, a place where they can just have a little bit of peace and enjoy the waterfront. And um, there's really been a very strong disconnection of people from knowing that they're in a waterfront community as um, Arif also pointed out. Next slide, please. So about three years ago, um, we've been around for 20 years and about three years ago, after we felt like we work at waterfront parks, we decided to survey the community and see where we could go next to make a difference. And we came upon Big Rock Beach and this is how we found it. Next slide, please. Karen, could you advance the slide? Or? Sorry, my screen froze for a second. You're oh. back. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> we'll just stare at this garbage. It's really <laughs> pretty impactful. <laughs> um, so, Karen, if you, never mind. I can run it if you're having a slowdown. Kathy got Sorry, my Zoom popped off and came back on for a moment, excuse me. So um, that's how we found it with all the pollution on the beach. And this was the access point. Um, and we've heard from people who have lived here for a long time. Um, some of the seniors who were maybe 70 years old, they remember when this community was Grantville and um, was all beachfront bungalows and they would, the, the neighbors made steps um, crude steps, you know, just to get down to the waterfront and they would swim and jump off the rock into the water, the big rock of Big Rock Beach um, into the water, have picnics and, and care for the beach. This was really around the 50s. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so in recent years, since this is our 20th anniversary, this is something we've been eyeing for a while. We decided to try and remove some of the larger debris from the beach. So um, this deck barge up in the top left, um, we chopped it into pieces, you know, there's foam and metal and we managed to remove this huge blight from the beach and clear up a lot of sandy space. Next slide, please. Um, 
So, and we also had it, we worked with a volunteer group from the Mission Continues, a group of veterans, and they helped us to somewhat stabilize the stairs so we could have passage for our cleanups. But um, really, I would say one of the biggest things that we need at this site is um, stability of stairs so people can have safe, easy, um, and enjoyable public access. Next slide, please. You know, this is amazing. Like this is just an incredibly beautiful site with views of LaGuardia. Um, you have World Fair Marina. You also have this boat blight, you know, like a shipwreck, Gilligan's Island over there on, to the left. And, um, you know, with all of the work that we've done at this beach, we're almost there. I feel like we're so on the cusp of giving this back to the community after many decades of it just being cut off because it was so, you know, undesirable of a place to go. Um, so I feel like we really are um, at a great juncture right now where with the right investment and with the little city caretaking, trash can, regular pickup, maintenance of the stairs, um, that we could be there. Next slide. Just a little history. <laughs> so a dock, people enjoying in boats with their wonderful one piece swimsuits and um, a very accessible beach. And this is the same spot. So this is what we hope to bring it back to. Kat, thank you so but much. That might be it. Yeah, Kat, thank you so much for the presentation. And uh, it's so great to, to finish on this slide, which reminds us what connection to our waterways uh, looked like a um, hundred years ago and how much we've lost and how much uh, potential there is to bring something like this back. Uh, and again, as we've been going through an exceptionally hot summer, uh, being reminded about how much um, value that this brings, not just in uh, recreation, but in combating urban heat and public health and, and giving that back to the community as well. So thank you for that. Um, Let's hop to another site in Queens, um, showing the, the geographic diversity of the borough. Um, this is uh, the Borden Avenue Street End in Long Island City, the partner, a community partner here being Newtown Creek Alliance. I'll run you through a couple of visuals here as well. The map, uh, which shows the uh, site along the Dutch Kills uh, and the waterfront access map. Again, you can see uh, shoreline access ar around LIC um, and a little bit in the kind of entry point into the creek on the Brooklyn side. But once you start getting in to the creek and the Long Dutch Kills, there are uh, no real waterfront access points. Uh, this is a really unique site. Um, the community has been very engaged with Newtown Creek Alliance, having built sort of a DIY skate park in the area kind of leading up to the street end. Uh, the street end is closed off by large concrete barricades, so there is kind of a little bit of um, a sort of runway uh, to the waterfront there. Um, the Dutch Kills waters are, are very quiet, um, which is great for, for boating. Um, this is uh, a site proximal TS to a CSO, uh, but we also know there are a lot of citizen water quality testing programs underway around Newtown Creek. Um, and again, really important to highlight the active community engagement at this site, uh, LaGuardia Community College, Dutch Kills Loop, and others have been cleaning, stewarding, boating, um, skating, uh, really bringing a sense of, of community and recreation to this really, really unique site. Um, the survey showed um, uh, an appetite for continued skateboarding, so a, a combination of what waterfront access looks like, um, a lot of interest in cleanups, 86% um, of the respondents wanted to see more waterfront access across the community. Uh, and again, um, some of the common needs highlighting expanded green space, uh, a small dock, stairs to safely get down. Again, you're hearing that theme of stairs to safely access the water um, and trash receptacles. Um, so these are just some really neat visuals of, of the skate park. Um, and I'd like to turn it over to our colleagues at Newtown Creek Alliance. Um, Willis Elkins uh, and Lore uh, Malatra Gadet to talk a little bit more about um, their work at this particular site. Great, uh, thanks so much, Karen. Um, I know we're a little tight on time, so I'll, I'll try to keep it okay. brief here. Um, the site, you know, is is really interesting, and it's great to hear the some of the similarities uh, with the with the other sites that are part of the study, uh, specifically the South Bronx and and the issue that 
really persists through a lot of the city where, you know, we get the city, the residents, the workers get access to waterways, uh, often only in tandem with large scale redevelopment and places like Newtown Creek, which are zoned for uh, industrial manufacturing purposes and which we want to preserve uh, often don't have a, a, a clear pathway as to how we can create access for both the people that are working there every day and then the people that are living nearby and coming to visit the, this, these sites on the weekends. Dutch Kill is a really interesting little tributary of Newtown Creek because there's so much interest uh, in trying to get access. And right now there's there's been none, no real investment. Um, it's all been sort of community led uh, power. And so we have people that are working there. LaGuardia College is literally a block away from, from the waterway. And while it's not a place where, like College Point, we envision that they'll be, you know, swimming in the near future um, because of the Superfund status and the water quality issues, uh, there's significant opportunity for, for recreation and also access to the water for research and education as well. And that's, that's a lot of the work that we do. Um, let's go to the next slide. So one of the things that's also kind of interesting I was thinking about hearing about with South Bronx is, you know, we also went through a, a comprehensive uh, planning strategy for, for Newtown Creek about five years ago. And there's also other sites that we've been working on. There's one street in that we, multiple community plans over 20 years. And unfortunately, two years ago, the city went forward with their own plan that completely disregarded what the community was asking for in terms of access. This site at Borden Avenue was actually, has not been on our radar for a long time in large part because there were giant fences blocking it off. And we didn't really, conceive of it as a as an accessible site um, because of the physical parameters there and one day we were doing a tour maybe three years ago with LaGuardia and they were specifically looking for places to get down to Dutch Kills with their professors and students to to sample the water and we walked sort of past the street end and I sort of was ignoring it because I was so used to the fences being there and then one of the students said what about down there and we looked and I was like oh my gosh the fences aren't there anymore and everyone just basically ran down to the water and was grabbing samples and instantly so people started picking up trash. So we've done a lot of cleanups there. Um, you can see this, these photos here from some of the cleanups we've had in the past few years, uh, removing, you know, tons of debris uh, from this site um, has been really, you know, a way to, to connect people to the, to the space and obviously physically improve it. Um, next slide. The, okay. The I think that's other, all we got. Oh, that's it. Okay. <laughs> and then the, I'll say the other thing the too that's been kind of interesting with the site is that um, the the skateboarding aspect that was something that you know again was not sort of part of our planning about access and that sort of yeah exactly had sort of um, um, developed on its own and people especially during the pandemic started going out there and building skate ramps and obstacles. And it turned into this sort of whole new use for the site that we had not envisioned and brought a whole new demographic to the site. So before where this, where this ramp was, you know, there was just a small barrier there. And this was a place where people were coming and still dumping stuff and all sorts of legal activities. And now it's a very vibrant community space. And so the, the opportunity for us to sort of bridge uh, new groups of users that are finding this location uh, and accessing it is is really interesting. And then, of course, the photo on the left here. This is a was a kind of a temporary dock we put in uh, for City of Water Day and partnered with North Brooklyn Community Boathouse and the artist Marie Lorenz to do uh, uh, tours, canoe tours on the waterway uh, with an active art installation as well. So, you know, I think it's really cool seeing these other projects and the it's discouraging seeing the these places where there's so much desire and need. Uh, for access to the waterways and that the city has not invested that, you know, these sort of resources, um, especially when sometimes it doesn't really take a lot. You know, we're talking about stairs, we're talking about a floating dock, um, but then also the power that, you know, community members and volunteers have to sort of help transform uh, these sites on their own. So my two cents about the site. That's great. Thank you for that, Willis. And um, really a very cool spot and can say on a personal level, I got to paddle during City of Water Day uh, from that little dock and uh, was really eye opening. And yeah, as a lifelong Queens resident, that was uh, that kind of blew my mind. I never thought I'd, I'd be in a boat on the Dutch Kills, but it was pretty a pretty remarkable experience. So 
thanks to thanks to Newtown Creek Alliance for making that happen. Um, so we've got one more uh, magical hidden gem to, to show you all, and that is the Front Street parking lot um, of the Upper Harbor um, in Staten Island. The community partner is Kayak Staten Island. Um, and walk you through um, some of the information on this one. This is uh, unlike the others, which are um, street ends largely, this is a, a large um, uh, parking lot site right at the water's edge. Um, if you look at the waterfront access map, um, it is just south of the new Stapleton waterfront um, park. Uh, one Im important thing just to mention here, so Waterfront Alliance did a report on this one and a half mile stretch of Staten Island from around Clifton Station where this um, site is located down to Fort Wadsworth and the issues of connectivity, uh, recreation, resiliency um, and maritime activation along that stretch which has so much possibility. Um, and one of the biggest issues is really the connectivity issue. There are so many gaps and making your way down the water's edge here um, is not a straight shot uh, either by foot, bike, public transit. Um, and so um, in some respects, uh, even though there are access points on the shoreline, the connectivity makes um, some of the access really challenging. Um, at the same time, Kayak Staten Island has really created a pretty remarkable uh, uh, program uh, around this site. Um, so what we do know is that this is a, a large parking lot under New York City Small Business Services jurisdiction, uh, offers a relatively quiet water location for, for boating, uh, which you'll hear more about. It's just south of the new Stapleton Waterfront Park. Uh, it's got sort of both riprap and soft shoreline uh, along the edge. Um, and, um, you know, some of the minor upgrades for, for access would include um, storage for boats, uh, which has been a long time ask of Kayak Staten Island. Um, and uh, it's worth mentioning that this is just an amazing view corridor of New York Harbor. Um, that is just an extraordinary uh, opportunity for, for locals and tourists really to, um, to see New York City uh, from this vantage point. We had some great survey responses here about um, the community being really enthused to volunteer, clean, maintain and run programs, which they're already doing. Um, more than 50% of respondents had voted at this site, which really shows that there is very active recreation underway at this informal site. 100% um, of respondents very interested in that waterfront access connectivity, really the Staten Island shoreline from you know, Fort Wadsworth to Tompkinsville. Um, and again, some of the most common needs, and we're hearing these across the board, uh, small dock, trash receptacles, shade and plantings and boat storage. Um, and I think uh, we had a, uh, a nice testimonial here worth pointing out from Makerspace NYC, which is located uh, in this area across the North Shore, uh, about how the community is really taking it upon itself to create these opportunities. Um, a lot of self-activation uh, is happening. Um, and again, I think uh, it's, it's great that we're seeing the sort of DIY aspect of these sites. Um, but it does go to show that it's, um, it's a lot that the community is undertaking to really create these opportunities for, for the public. And I'd love to turn it over at this point to TJ Smolka from Kayak Staten Island to tell us a little bit more about this site. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, all of these projects that have been showcased today are so amazing and it's been really a pleasure to work with the Waterfront Alliance and thanks to everybody that's worked with us so far. Um, I'm a teacher at a local school right near this site, actually, and um, we also run a project called Kayak Staten Island. Myself, Annette Pierce, and James Limperopoulos um, took over for Jackie Crow, who was a person that was running it for many years and recently passed away due to cancer. Um, so the three of us uh, jumped in to help uh, activate this space. Um, it, we run an entirely volunteer-run organization, and what we do is we provide free and low-cost kayaking to the public. And Front Street, uh, we received a grant uh, about four or five years ago uh, to activate programming at Front Street, and the community response has been overwhelming. Um, in my lifetime, Front Street has always been a mess. Uh, next slide, please. Um, sorry, even, even more slide. Next slide, please. Yeah, Front Street has always been a mess. Um, there's always been abandoned cars there. Most recently, we've had a plague of, I would say, 15 or 20 just abandoned tractor trailers there. Um, there's tons of garbage. 
And as Karen mentioned, the waterfront is broken. The access is very limited to get down to the waterfront, but it really is a beautiful space. Um, the community is, is rising in a way that's great. It's not that a bunch of rich people moved in and then like took over. It really is that the entire community uh, around this space is growing and thriving. There's lots of artists moving into the space. Um, and um, this has kind of traditionally been a space where people would go to maybe go fishing, um, but it has always been kind of run down. Um, and we, we struggle actually with bringing our equipment down there. The city does not let us store boats at this space. Um, and no city agencies have taken responsibility for this property. In fact, when DCOS was located, it was low, uh, informed that this may be their space um, and that there were problems, they erected a fence and tried to prevent the public from getting there instead of like activating it and, and uh, bringing people in. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Front Street is absolutely gorgeous. You can see the view of New York City. My personal favorite, I love the Staten Island Ferry. I love the fact that we can bring people to the water. They get to float around on on uh, this beautiful space, see the Verrazano Bridge. We take them for a tour down to the Alice Austin House, sometimes all the way to the bridge. And we really would like to do more. Um, the, the, the vision for our organization is to, especially with schools nearby like mine, Curtis High School, other traditionally low income schools that are around this space, um, activating citizen science programs, environmental stewardship. Um, we really would love to bring more art and cultural events to this space. Um, there's tons of people who fish here and people just come here to park and just enjoy the view. Um, and it would be great if we could do more activation around this site. The community would really love that. And uh, just that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, TJ. I I my... <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much for that presentation. And um, it's really great to see that on this site where you have a lot of space to work with, that the programming potential is really quite large, not just for the boating, but for some of the arts and cultural things that you describe. Um, and uh, again, a lot of room for improvement in terms of the infrastructure and, and even starting with some basic things like boat storage, which um, comes up at this site and other sites that we visited in the context of our research. Sometimes the community group is just uh, asking for something uh, relatively simple like a storage container for kayaks so folks can have um, an easier and safer time getting boats into the water. So I know we're uh, nearing our time and I wanna save a couple of minutes for Q&A. Um, these are just a couple of highlights from City of Water Day. Uh, this year and some of the programming that took place uh, at these sites. Um, and some of our next steps uh, in terms of the work that Waterfront Alliance community partners uh, and others um, are looking to do is to um, brief the various electeds uh, who represent these sites uh, and seek potential funding for uh, some of the capital improvements or for engineering or concept designs around these sites. Um, also look for additional grant funding for additional site analysis and advocacy because there are uh, upwards of a thousand of these underutilized city owned waterfront sites. Um, there's continued opportunity for community driven design charrettes um, and working to support those groups that are already uh, very actively highlighting um, sites along, for example, Gowanus Creek or City Island where there are similar efforts underway to activate um, city owned sites. Um, you know, we're, we recognize that activating these sites poses regulatory and administrative challenges, including jurisdictional transfers, uh, operations and maintenance, uh, funding and safety. Um, I think it's really important um, to point out and the city's comprehensive waterfront plan points out that, um, you know, the street ends have been overlooked and uh, they've lacked some of the kind of rigorous review that other public spaces in the city have received. Um, most street ends remain underused, even as COVID-19 has underscored the importance of expanding open space opportunities. Um, and this is really um, um, a missed opportunity. Um, and we're really strongly advocating through this project that coordination between city agencies, community stewards, and local users is um, elevated to advance um, outcomes. So with that, um, I'll, I'll pause here. Uh, and happy to take some of your questions. Um, you can pop them in the chat uh, or raise your hand. Uh, and I'll try in the last 10 minutes here to 
uh, address some of the questions. Uh, let me take a look at the chat here. So Karen, I think yeah. some of the, there are a lot of questions. I think what we should do is for the questions that are directed to the partners, uh, let's we'll email them to you and and make sure that we get a response back. So if for people who ask questions, if you could also include your email addresses, just to that would be great. And we'll make we'll make sure to copy and paste all of the chat and get it to questions that are specific to uh, to the specific people. Um, and I think what we should answer just in this limited amount of time is the question about any funding available from the National Infrastructure Bill for these projects. Have federal Congress people or state assembly members or senators been good in, in getting resources so far? And then also, um, I believe there was a question about um, uh, private enclosure and gentrification as well. So, um, so Karen, do you want to take a stab at the sure. first? Or go ahead. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks for all the good questions. And yeah, certainly, I think there are opportunities uh, in the National Infrastructure Bill. I think there may be opportunities in the State Environmental Bond Act um, if it's passed uh, in, on, in November on the ballot question. Um, I think that, you know, the city, um, you know, has a real opportunity to identify projects um, that would benefit from infrastructure funding through the various pots of money um, in, in the infrastructure bill. Uh, there, there's other federal legislation um, that could be in the pipeline, the New York, New Jersey Watershed Protection Act, uh, the Great American Outdoors Act, which was passed last year. Um, there are federal resources that are available and understanding that activating some of these sites is, um, you know, uh, has a, a budget attached to it that absolutely, um, I think the city identifying these projects and then helping to go to bat for them in the funding applications uh, is absolutely um, an opportunity. Um, I'm happy to have others weigh in from our side on that as well. The only thing I'd ask is just going to take a bit of time. The, the, the process is pretty slow, but yeah, uh, that's my only other response. So, so yeah, um, I would just go I ahead. also add quickly. I, I think regarding the level of access and the amount of work that needs to be done i think there are places like uh, big rock beach which would need a small grant level type of funding i think a location like in the south bronx where the cso is directly proximal and there are more multiple partners that would need larger omb level capital kind of funding or other large funding which is why it's so important to have the elected officials engaged and I, I did mention, I did, I did see that Trevor Thompson placed a few questions about access for disabled persons. Um, I think that is part of the conversation and the overall design and how the community sees access being afforded and making sure that all community members are given an opportunity to get to the waterfront sites. You know, currently those sites have stairs, but there could be other design elements given to provide greater access for a larger uh, members, of the, larger population of the community. Yeah, th thank you for that, Ray. Absolutely. I think there are uh, design considerations that, um, you know, we're, we're in a position to explore all of that, right? I think that's what some of this effort is about, um, seeing what we can do with design for the sites that would allow for um, ADA accessibility, that would allow for, for uh, expanded public use. So I think there's a lot of potential to continue to explore those questions through design and engineering analysis. Um, I did want to address the question in here from Ryan Barker about um, how do we ensure community investments of time and money do not fall victim to private enclosure and gentrification. Um, I think this is a, you know, a major challenge that um, and major conversation that happens around waterfront access. Um, you know, some of some of the city's uh, waterfront access, um, some of the nicest waterfront access we see is um, privately built but publicly accessible. Um, and I think, you know, there's, a, there's a place for that, but I think this report is really making the case that uh, parks equity uh, and open space equity remains a major, major issue in this city, uh, who has access and where and the quality of the access. And it's important to recognize that the public investments in these sites that have had historic disinvestment um, is, is, um, is, is a public good. Um, I should call out New Yorkers for Parks and their 1% for Parks campaign here. 
um, which has been uh, advocating to get the city budget for parks operation and maintenance um, up to 1%. It's, it's something along the lines of 0.6% now, which is a major, major issue to the success of an effort of this nature. Uh, we have to make these investments and give communities the, the funding and the tools to make these quality sites. We know that the community is in it. Um, we know that there are friends groups and, and, and conservancy type models that some of these um, uh, communities will be able to activate given the, given the activism and, that you see here already today. But it will take um, uh, you know, keeping the pressure on the city and the parks department to make some of these investments um, to really, I think, bridge, bridge that um, equity gap. Also, if I just quickly mention, I think one of the things that should be noted is that some of this is also aspirational. I think Willis pointed to the Borden Avenue and the Superfund site and the aspects of a complicated remediation plan and conversations. So, um, you know, clearly tomorrow people won't swim in, in Dutch kills. However, there are locations that are very quickly accessible, right? So I think we have to think about that. And then during the planning process, you know, we, we, we mentioned CSOs. We didn't talk a lot about water quality. Clearly, we have to make sure that we have safe access to the water and that during the, the review process and the planning process for access, we're taking into consideration the proximity of the CSO and that citizen water quality testing to get people engaged and understanding you know, what is actually happening in the water at their location. Uh, so we, I'm going to answer uh, two questions or, or add to the question about the um, gentrification. Just to be clear, all the sites that we've analyzed are public sites, owned, or not public, but they're owned by the public. They're owned by New York City. So in terms of privatization of the sites themselves, that's really not something that that is likely to happen. And, and, and the analysis is entirely based on uh, publicly owned or New York City owned sites in in uh, in New York City, and then there's a question about whether or not we're looking at sites in New Jersey. So the funding for this project came from the New York City Green Fund, which is squarely centered on recreational improvements for New York City, and and a lot of it came from the need the the need for recreation that was really really made much more clear during the pandemic and how important it was for people to be able to get out and to enjoy enjoy um, open space and how many improvements we need to make to open space, both on the land and in the water. In terms of New Jersey, though, I mean, I, I think our hope for, for Waterfront Alliance is that this type of analysis and work can expand to outside of New York City and, and expand within New York City. And it, it really is just squarely dependent on whether or not the Waterfront Alliance and our partners are able to raise the funding to, to do this type of analysis, but also the funding to keep up the advocacy and to push for the change that is needed, because I think everybody can see here that this is super simple, but we do think there are some simple solutions and, um, and things that are really basic that can happen. And if, so, I just add, if I just add quickly, yeah. so I think the, 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 the ranking criteria and the way we approached the systematic review of the sites can be duplicated for the rest of the sites around the city. It can be duplicated for the shoreline in New Jersey that's directly proximal to the harbor and other places. So that's a tool that we could use for the future. Yeah, and I believe that this that that's a great point, right? And what we're hoping is that this tool and the methodology that we use can be maybe improved where it needs to be improved, but but used as a model for ensuring that the sites that have the most potential to serve the greatest need are identified before political power and access to resources are, are um, maybe setting the standard. So that's a really important part of this project. I know we're hitting our, our end time here and I just wanted to give one 20 second um, plug to recognizing the need for the co-benefits that these sites provide for in terms of climate resiliency. Um, and green infrastructure. Somebody pointed out these being located in the floodplain and we definitely uh, in the report, if you take a look, looked at climate hazards at each one of these sites uh, from urban heat to flood risk and to really recognize that any capital improvements provide a lot of opportunity for green infrastructure, stormwater management, um, drainage um, and really improving not only the recreational possibilities but the coastal resiliency uh, of these various sites and that increasingly we really need to be thinking about waterfront projects uh, in that way 
So definitely looking forward to continuing the conversation around that. Um, I'll turn it over to Courtney for the last word. Yeah, we're, we're going to wrap up right now. I just want to thank Karen in particular. I don't know if, I, if everyone realizes that this is Karen's official last day with the Waterfront Alliance, and we're going to miss her dearly. Uh, but Karen, amazing work leading this entire project and getting it to this point. And so you'll be hearing more from us on next steps. And uh, and thank you all for taking time this morning. And we will draft, we'll make sure to get information to you from some of the other questions in the chat. And many thanks to our partners and all the people, all of the people, the volunteers and community members that make these possibilities look like they can come, become real and big. And that's just so important. So thanks to to um, to all all of you and everyone. So. Uh, all right. Take care, everyone. See you later. Have a great rest of the week. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Karen. Take care. Thanks, everyone.